Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining our webinar today, Planes, Trains, Automobiles, and Staying Safe Online. Uh, today we have a great group of panelists. We're gonna talk about everything you need to know for how to stay safe online when booking a trip or traveling this summer. And uh, please note this webinar is being recorded. It will be available to everyone um, afterwards, probably by uh, tomorrow morning. So uh, we'll send an email out with the recording. Um, and at any point, feel free to put questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as possible by the end of the webinar. Next, just a little bit about us. Uh, we're the National Cybersecurity Alliance, and it's our mission to empower a more secure, interconnected world. We do this uh, by running free educational campaigns throughout the year, such as uh, the ones you see on the side, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, coming up in October, Cybersecure My Business, a program for small and mid-sized businesses, our HBCU career program for students, Data Privacy Week, in January as well. And these are just a few of the programs we run throughout the year. Um, we have tons of free resources and tips and advice available on our website, staysafeonline.org. So if you're ever looking for more resources or simple tips on how to stay safe online, uh, check it out and we'll provide more information about our website at the end of the webinar. So now please welcome our speakers. I'll turn it over to Lisa Plagmeyer, the Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance to get us started. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. We're really excited. We have a great group. Um, we'll start with um, Liz. Uh, Liz Booser is with um, ARP. She's a Senior Advisor in fraud prevention programs. Thanks for joining us, Liz. Um, next, we have Lindsay Carraher, Interagency Liaison, Office of Cyber Threat Investigations for the Department of State. Thank you for being with us. Nick McDermott. Nick, I'm glad we worked out your technical issues and you're with us now. If you want to turn on your uh, camera and unmute yourself, we'll be ready to go. Um, Nick is with Marriott. He's Director of Cyber Incident Response. And um, then we have Jessica Willingham, Senior Analyst, Cybersecurity with Southwest Airlines. So thank you everybody for being with us today. Um, let's get started with some of our panel questions. Nick, we'll start with you. Um, as someone who deals with cyber incident response, you see firsthand- how Excellent, this is good afternoon. Oh. Good. Um, as someone who deals with cyber incident response, you see firsthand how malicious actors are coming up with innovative ways to steal sensitive data. Um, what are some of the new trends that you're seeing in this area as it relates to travel? Yep, so as it relates to travel, especially within the hospitality industry right now, we're observing, you know, continued trend with social engineering, uh, phishing attacks where uh, essentially threat actors will uh, masquerade as either a hotel or one of the outside travel agencies such as booking.com or um, Expedia and will essentially attempt to elicit payment uh, in advance from uh, either the guest or they actually are attempting to do things like that with refunds with the hotels themselves. Um, so it's pretty effective and interesting actually. They are, um, we can tell that they're using or looking at uh, credential dump databases to leverage uh, legitimate compromised credentials from potential consumers, um, a lot of password reuse uh, going on. So, you know, they'll take those accounts, they'll get uh, personal information, whether it be your credit card number, or, you know, within our industry, it's certainly more um, related to loyalty fraud. So they'll come in and take your points from any hotels that you stay with or anything like that. Um, so with those, you know, some of the key things that you can do to, um, protect yourself, right? You can start using password managers to cut down on password reuse. They're a little bit uh, tough to get accustomed to, but once you do, you can have it generate passwords for you that are extra secure that you don't necessarily have to memorize. It will input those passwords into the forms for you so that you, uh, again, are a bit more secure with the way your identity is being handled across the internet and across the different platforms that you're on. Um, also, just be very cognizant of who's calling you, who you're dealing with when it comes to social engineering and things of that nature. Um, a hotel is typically not going to call you and ask for prepayment um, unless they've already discussed it with you prior. 
Um, so if you do receive one of those calls, question the individual. Um, you know, if you don't still don't feel comfortable, hang up and call the property with which you're staying or you have a reservation. Um, another thing that we are seeing is there is a lot of uh, new devices and hardware devices that are very easy to take um, a lot of our RFID devices. So, you know, all of our credit cards and debit cards have RFID, RFID chips in them these days. And they have devices where you can just come over and scan somebody's pocket if they get close enough to you, thinking uh, whether that be at a guest checkout counter, check-in counter, uh, or in an airport when you're, you know, getting ready to board the plane, everybody kind of cramps together. So just be cognizant and be aware of uh, who's around you, your spatial awareness and everything is important. But also with that front, they do sell, uh, they're starting to sell wallets and backpacks and things that do block those signals uh, so that folks can't execute that activity against you. Um, so that's kind of a quick gist of some of the, the stuff that we're seeing pretty frequently right now. Um, again, maintaining with the social engineering. It's I can't tell people to question um, any anybody who's calling them uh, without... Uh, it, unexpectedly. So make sure you verify, validate their identity and um, make sure you're comfortable with what information you're giving out. Nick, you actually sparked a memory for me because I remember a long time ago, it's probably been a decade or more before I was in cybersecurity that I got a nice friendly email from Marriott telling me I was using um, a compromised password and, and to change it. And I didn't. <laughs> And I woke up one day and back then, it was before Bonvoy, my Marriott Awards points were wiped out. I called Marriott. You guys were able to actually, the um, the the criminal had actually was trying to move the points to a, another service where they could then cash them out somehow. Um, and you guys were able to get me my points back. But that's when I started changing my passwords, <laughs> not using the same one oh, many times over and over again, because it was hundreds of thousands of points. And um and now I use a password manager and I've rid myself of that bad habit. But um, I, I had completely forgotten about that until, <laughs> until you mentioned that. Yeah. It's yeah and actually, actually, we've taken a lot of corrective measures on our side for that exact scenario as well. So we do have multi-factor authentication enabled on our Bonvoy platform um, so that anytime you make any changes, so that if somebody's trying to take over your account, whether change their email, change your phone number and your contact information, uh, we're able to identify that and you know hopefully you don't accept the uh one-time code to um to access the account yep yep no it's gotten it's gotten a lot better and and my habits have gotten a lot better as well um does anybody have anything to to add to that what their um what innovation they're seeing on the part of the malicious actors um yeah so good afternoon everybody i'm lindsay Carher. Um, just to give you a, a better picture of the world I come from, um, the, so the State Department has one of the largest and most challenging cyber landscapes globally. Um, we have 275 diplomatic posts overseas, tens of thousands of employees. Um, we're frequently targeted by some of the most sophisticated and well-funded hackers out there. Um, the directorate I fall within is the department's monitoring and incident response team. Um, we evaluate emerging technologies. We work closely with law enforcement on cyber threats and cyber crime. Um, and we're tasked with keeping everybody on the department's network safe, as well as cyber practitioners. Our mission is to enable diplomacy worldwide. Um, and so I just want to uh, make a note is I think it's really important that a lot of people um, don't consider themselves a target or they think that this type of stuff will never happen to them. Um, but you have to take a step back sometimes and realize maybe you're not the person that has what they're looking for. It might be a friend, a family member, or a peer that you know, a colleague, and they could be using you to get to somebody else. Um, and there are a few advanced persistent threats, also known as APTs or state-sponsored actors, uh, which really translates to money and resources made available for cyber activities. Um, and there's a few that focus on targeting travel industries specifically with the intent to perform monitoring, tracking, or surveillance operations against specific individuals, such as government employees, academia, people affiliated with the military or aerospace defense companies, journalists, among many others. Um, and you can be more vulnerable when you are preparing to travel and apply less scrutiny to emails or texts you're receiving because you are expecting information as it relates to your travel plans, hotels, agents, or airfare. So that really makes a great opportunity for an adversary to try and send you a malicious email. Um, APT 28, which is attributed to Russia, 
um, targeted travelers booking hotels throughout Europe and, middle, and the Middle East. Um, and one of the ways they targeted people was by using spear phishing emails with the intent to either harvest credentials or for financial gain. Um, other groups with a high interest in the travel industry include APT39, uh, which has a suspected attribution to Iran, and APT27 and 41, which both have suspected attribution to China. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for that level of detail. Um, that's uh, interesting and, ter and terrifying <laughs> at the same time. That's, it's helpful for the a lot of security professionals we have on the call today who run training awareness programs. It's helpful for them to have that context. For sure. Um, Liz, let's turn to you for a minute. So as travel services like Airbnb become increasingly popular, especially with aging adults who um, have the luxury of having more time to travel often, um, so do the online scams that come with the those services. What, um, what cyber safe security tips do you have for travelers to keep in mind while booking their next trip? Absolutely, Lisa. Um, and this is just a handful of tips. Folks can go to our website, aarp.org slash fraudwatch network for more. But, you know, we all book travel uh, nowadays. And as Lindsay and Nick were talking, I uh, echo your the kind of terror you're feeling, uh, Lisa, because we have some travel coming up. But if you are booking travel, um, you know, first of all, book on the official website of the hotel, the airline, or other travel business, or use a reputable third-party booking site. Um, and you'll also wanna carefully check the travel website's URL. Um, some scam sites may use a domain spoofing trick, like an extra letter in the address um, while they're mimicking major travel companies' branding. And you're also going to want to keep an eye out for a hotel, airline, or travel website that has odd spelling or grammatical errors, um, because that suggests it may have been created by a scammer in a foreign country. And also when you're booking, you know, look for written policies on canceling or modifying reservations and confirm them before you're booking. And then after you do your booking on the travel website, call the hotel or the airline and confirm your reservation. If they don't have a record of your booking, uh, that's a problem that you need to resolve before you travel. Additionally, if you, if you land on an unfamiliar travel website, check it out before you're booking. So go to a search engine, search the company's name, plus the uh, words like review or complaint or scam. And that way you can see if other consumers have had bad experiences with a site. And also check out the Better Business Bureau's website um, and their database, uh, bbb.org. Couple more tips for you. So avoid clicking on links and emails with travel promotions like free airline tickets or warnings that your hotel loyalty points are about to expire. And you wanna put your mouse over the link to check whether it goes to a legitimate travel site. And when you're booking, uh, use credit cards instead of your debit card because it offers better fraud protection. I think the bottom line is this, do your research. And remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Probably is. That's right. Thank you. I know a lot of you are frantically taking notes, but don't forget this will be uh, available recorded as well because there's this is a content rich uh, webinar. It's a good thing. Lots of lots of good advice. Um, Lindsay, what does this look like from the bad guy's perspective? We, we've heard from Liz about what we need to watch out for. Uh, what can you tell us a little bit about uh, the other side of the coin, if you will? Definitely. Um, so when traveling to high risk countries or areas where there's a limited ability to provide consular services, you really want to be sensitive to the environment you're going into. Before you travel, it's been recommended to erase sensitive photos, comments, other materials from your social media pages, cameras, laptops, or other electronics. Um, that could be considered controversial or provocative by the local group. Um, I recently traveled to Hong Kong, um, and prior to leaving the United States, I just went through and removed all my social media um, to be safe and respectful as well. Um, and so I love comparing the world of cyber to physical security because that's much more tangible and visible also. Um, if you create a strong password and change them regularly, um, that's great and you can equate that to locking your house up and being secure. Um, but if you're not protecting that information, you're leaving the windows of your house open um, for anybody to just jump in. Um, and one example of that, um, that I was actually asked about um, on, one, on my briefing trip last week was um, this, it's on social media and you're asked 25 questions about yourself. Um, where did you meet your spouse? What's your favorite color? Um, what's your mother's maiden name? 
Um, well, if you ever need to recover your password on most of your accounts, um, probably your banking accounts, work accounts, um, because you forgot your password, you're most likely gonna be asked those questions. Where did you meet your spouse? What's your favorite color? Um, these are the security questions that are supposed to be locking the windows of your house. Um, but when it's posted on social media, which um, apparently it was really popular, somebody can easily just go onto your Facebook account or Instagram or whatever it is um, and copy and paste it from your post to whatever account they're trying to get into. And you're immediately compromised as a result because they have your security question answered. Um, and threat actors, specifically advanced persistent threats, do a substantial amount of research on their targets. And that includes looking at your activity on social media to better position themselves for social engineering. Um, not to be more scary at all. <laughs> no, that's super helpful. Um, I recently stayed in an Airbnb. I, I don't do it very often, but I stayed in one lately. And there were some cameras around the house and around the property. Um, Nick, I know that that Marriott now offers uh, bookings of, of homes, not just hotel properties. Can you talk to me a little bit about what we need to know about uh, cameras? Yep. So with Marriott properties, luckily we control those and we have uh, standards. We're not going to put any cameras in the living space for uh, for the guests that may stay there. However, Airbnb, those properties are owned by um, individuals, right? It's not necessarily a conglomerate. There's not many people checking and inspecting the properties um, after guests leave or, you know, if the owner himself or herself have uh, placed cameras around. So uh, it's one thing to be cognizant of, you know, check common areas is anywhere that you might be uh, feeling vulnerable. You want to make sure there's maybe, maybe no cameras in there. Um, if you do find one, um, remove it, call your local police and local law enforcement and have them assist you with the problem. Um, the other thing is be cognizant of cameras on the outside of these types of houses. They do, a lot of them have microphones. So maybe any conversations you might be wanting to have, don't have them next to the camera. Um, and then also uh, just a consideration with Airbnb, um, in those types of properties, you're connecting to a, um, if you do connect to their Wi-Fi, you're connecting to something that isn't controlled um, by anybody. So that owner or whoever may have put uh, some kind of device to capture your traffic or, um, you know, just inspect what you're doing, what's going on, monitoring it um, for later use or um, whatever they may see fit. So just be cognizant of those things. Certainly use a VPN when you're connecting to any untrusted Wi-Fi or unsecure Wi-Fi networks and stuff like that. Jessica, let's move to you with a, a question about airlines and airports. Um, a lot of them are offering free Wi-Fi to passengers, but those networks are typically unsecured and those can pose the security threats to, the, to people using them then. So how do bad actors use these open networks to steal sensitive data? What's going on behind the scenes? Well, the good news is that um, public Wi-Fi is actually much more secure than it used to be. Um, obviously, anytime you're connecting to something that you don't know about, um, there is a degree of risk, but um, most websites are secured these days. So even if um, the Wi-Fi spot that you're on belongs to an airline, an airport, a hotel, um, Starbucks, whatever, um, as long as you know what you're log like, as long as you know that you are logging into that organization's Wi-Fi spot, you're probably gonna be okay. Um, just kind of pay attention to what you're doing. Um, if you're doing something um, really sensitive, maybe don't do it there. Um, but as a general rule, even if someone does wanna snoop on what you're doing, um, most of what they're gonna be able to see is that you went to a website, not necessarily what you did on that website. That's not necessarily, like it's not always the case. It's just the vast majority of the time. If you're at an Airbnb or something like that, um, like Nick said, definitely it's a kind of different ball game there. Um, they, you don't know what they could have um, installed on those systems. So be extra cognizant there. Um, but generally your, your run of the mill airport aircraft Wi-Fi um, is, is going to be okay as long as you know what you're on. Um, and um, it's also, it, as long as like your, your um, security updates are all done and everything, I know they're terribly annoying to do, um, but they're even more important to have when you're traveling, right? 
Um, as Nick said, VPNs are really great for personal use, especially the, the ones that, like you see them advertised on like YouTube and podcasts and things like that too. Um, but you are also, well, uh, you're you're just kind of transferring where your data is going through. So you are paying for the privilege of giving all of your data to that VPN provider instead, um, if it's for personal use. So um, full disclosure, I don't use one when I'm traveling for personal use, um, and I use I use my work one if I'm working um, while on the go. But I I don't actually use one when traveling um, in that way, um, and generally I if the as long as you're just doing general web browsing and things like that uh you're probably gonna be be all right more privacy concerns then about using the a, v, a consumer grade VPN is that it personally a little bit yeah <laughs> okay now I use the I use a VPN that I trust um that's used by a lot of enterprises as well um, because I think about situations where I might be um, needing to do something like banking or something financial related, and I am on public Wi-Fi. Um, I think the advice we generally give people is to use a VPN if they're in that kind of situation. Um, anybody else have an opinion on that they want to share? Yes to VPN? I don't know, comes down to trust, right? So it depends who you trust with your data. So I think VPNs and a lot of these companies have been around long enough, um, whether that be Nord or um, Private Internet Access, um, they're trusted, reputable. I think they get a good handle on their internal security. So I certainly feel confident using it and I feel a level of protection when I do use it um, if I am connected to something that I do not control. Yeah, so, so read reviews, do your research carefully if you're choosing a VPN. Um, they've definitely gotten, I think, more, there's been more wide adoption and, and they've gotten more affordable for personal use since COVID, since we found ourselves working from home and everybody getting in the habit of using one because so many of our employers require us to use one um, at home or when we're traveling. So um, read your, read reviews. And I'm pretty sure consumerreports.org has an article that reviews VPNs and that includes um, access to your data, privacy concerns, all, all that good stuff. Um, Okay, so Lindsay, back to you. As as interagency liaison, you're building connections and partnerships with other federal agencies and, and partner nations. Can you talk to us about how the Department of State is working with other government agencies to ensure that consumers are protected while traveling? Yeah, so uh, the department is highly interested in working with the whole of government, and we believe that all agencies should have a part to play in the defense of the nation within the cyber realm. Um, and each of the agencies I've worked with brings a really unique perspective on the best way to protect our travelers. Um, I meet pretty regularly with my counterparts on any new TTP, which tactics, techniques, and procedures um, that have been observed by threat actors anywhere. Um, along with any new ideas about anything anybody's tried um, or evolved to mitigate and counter these threats. Um, I've worked with some partner nations on the type of information that's being briefed to travelers when they go overseas. Um, stuff like VPN does kind of uh, bake in there as well. Um, a big focus that we, along with our partners, have um, our mobile devices. Um, we've collaborated to develop and share ideas on best practices to secure your device, such as auditing application permissions. Um, and just like Nick had mentioned about the microphones and people being able to use them, uh, restrict the use of microphone, camera, and location on your device if that application does not need it. Um, these are all excellent vectors for an adversary um, because it is much more rewarding and useful to target somebody's actual physical phone, which has their entire life on it. Um, it has your contacts, uh, probably work stuff, uh, because I know sometimes we have trouble uh, having that boundary between work-life balance. Um, it could have, it has our whole world on it, truly. Um, and so that is much more beneficial to the adversaries rather than just trying to intercept um, and take snippets of conversations, pictures, anything like that. Um, an example of this, uh, similar to what Nick had said, um, you may have your phone 10, 15 feet away from you. You're not on it. Um, you may have, you may be chatting with your friends, um, but your microphone suddenly becomes enabled and someone is now listening to your conversation from afar. 
Um, same thing can happen with your camera, your video starts going, you're being recorded. Um, sharing your location can also present a physical risk if you're being tracked by somebody who may have hacked into your phone. Um, those are some of the really exciting things that we get to figure out how to mitigate and counter um, with our partners. Um, but as far as like internal within the United States, um, there was actually a really great comprehensive joint cybersecurity advisory um, published a couple days ago by multiple agencies. Highly recommend everybody read it, revolving around the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, um, which is DPRK, also known as North Korea. Um, and the DPRK has worked for decades um, and decades to perfect their craft in social engineering, and they do it very well. Um, the advisory details how this group conducts reconnaissance, how they impersonate users to accomplish their collection requirements. Um, essentially, they'll impersonate somebody, most likely a journalist or a colleague that sounds really familiar to you, so you feel comfortable and you believe them. Um, and they'll ask you for information, such as what your views are on like North Korea, maybe to fill out a survey, uh, ask you to download something, or maybe just to strike up a conversation so they can send you something malicious down the road. Um, there are mitigations listed in that advisory, but just to give you a quick preview, it's use MFA on everything, use really strong passwords, passphrases are ideal. Um, complicated passwords were made for computers, or were made for people, not computers, and we can crack passwords, We not at the Department of State, but we as people um, can crack passwords um, using tools now. So you want to use a passphrase, which is multiple uh, characters. Um, and don't enable my macros on documents that are sent via email unless the source is verified. So whenever you see a pop-up, when you open an email, it'll say, will you download, the, uh, enable this macro? It always pops up at the top of like a Word document. Um, that is one of the most common ways um, to download some nasty piece of malware that you don't see. Um, and the US government really encouraged victims of any of this type of stuff to report suspicious activities. Um, and then in this case, specifically those related to DPRK cyber activities. And if you have any information about these things in cyberspace, including past or ongoing operations of the DPRK, when you provide that information, um, we have a, a Department of State Reward for Justice program um, where they give out awards of up to $5 million because um, then it gives us a better holistic approach of what the, what the threat environment really is. So again, not to be too scary, um, but that's just what the, uh, the threat environment is. It's really spicy, but there are a lot of joint cybersecurity advisories that are posted um, on, uh, I believe CISA posts them pretty regularly. You can find them on LinkedIn. Um, and they're very informative and a great way to stay up to date on some of those things. Great, thank you for that. Um, Liz, so, so you're working with folks in the older demographic. What advice do you have specifically for them to keep their devices secure while traveling? I know this is a challenge I have with um, with my parents and, and uh, you know, not, not being in the same room with them and trying to help them um, set up MFA on different accounts and things like that. And um, it can be confusing. I think a lot of us have had the experience of being on a, a FaceTime or a Zoom call with our parents trying to actually, you know, hold the device up and explain where to click and what to do. Um, but talk to me a little bit about what kind of advice you give um, the folks that are uh, AARP members. Sure. So actually, I'm just going to, I guess a lot of what I, we advise people with was touched on already. And really, it's tips that anybody of any age should be following anyway. So like Jessica said, keep your device's operating system updated, you know, always install and update when you're prompted, um, since the new version may replace a version that criminals could exploit. And that also goes for your device's security, like the firewall, antivirus software, anti-malware. Um, make sure you're running these programs and keeping them current. Another piece of advice which has been touched on, protect your passwords. Don't share them with anyone. And if you write them down, uh, store them safely. Um, and Lindsay mentioned too, use a unique password or passphrase for each online account you have. It is so hard to do that, but as was mentioned, if a scammer cracks one password that you use on multiple sites, they have access to all those accounts. Um, and I think Nick mentioned earlier, uh, you might want to consider a password manager. I think Lisa, you said you're using one of those. Um, and you can look up information online to find one that may fit your needs. 
Just a couple of other tips, you know, turn off your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth when you're not using them. Log out of your account when you're finished using it. Don't stay uh, logged in. And then regarding public Wi-Fi, uh, we talk a lot about this on our end. So don't allow your device to automatically connect to any available Wi-Fi network. Um, and as was touched on, be careful what you do on it. So we say generally it's okay to browse the web and check news, weather, or traffic, uh, but don't use it to do online banking, to make purchases, to check email, to use social media. Basically, uh, we say don't use public Wi-Fi to access any site where you have to enter a username and a password. Um, additionally, you know, don't trust that your mobile apps will be secure on a public network as well. Um, some apps out there don't encrypt information properly. Uh, so we say it's better to use them on your mobile provider's data network instead. And then I, I will chime in on the VPN comment. Um, we do tell folks consider signing up for a VPN, especially if you travel extensively or use public Wi-Fi often, since it will encrypt your data even on unsecured public Wi-Fi networks. Um, and again, these are tips that anybody of any age should be following anyway. So that scenario where I'm trying to help my my parents, um, what what work does the ARP do to support adult children like me who are trying to help their parents as they adapt to the to the digital age? So what's great about AARP's resources um, is, you know, they're available to folks, whether or not you're 50 plus, whether or not you're a member of AARP. So we have a lot of um, resources on aarp.org slash tech. It's the AARP Personal Technology Resource Center. So two in particular I wanted to highlight. One is um, a collaboration with Senior Planet. And so um, we have links to free online classes there. These are available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. And it can help older adults in general to learn more about technology and safely connect with others, uh, you know, for exercising, socializing, uh, you name it. We also have an AARP virtual community center, and these are free interactive classes and events that are designed to help older adults try something new, to learn new skills, and to have fun while doing it. And um, the site, again, which is aarp.org slash tech, uh, has great articles and videos on how you can stay safe online, how you can protect your privacy while you're online. There's smartphone tutorials, how you can improve your life with technology. Um, and these are easy to understand, easily digestible uh, resources uh, for older, older adults and for anybody. Awesome. So let's circle back. Earlier in the conversation, we started off talking about travel scams, um, things like Airbnb, third party, um, third party booking platforms. I think Nick mentioned a few. Um, it could be Expedia or, or any of those. They're frequently uh, targets for online scams. So, uh, and I'll throw this question out to the group. What are some of those red flags? We've mentioned a, t a few, but let's make sure we've covered um, all the various red flags that travelers can look, look for to spot scams when they're uh, potentially trying to plan travel using third party sites. So I'll just uh, chime in with one tip I didn't mention before. Um, if you're traveling abroad, and we've talked about uh, traveling abroad on this, if you need a tourist visa, get it directly from the website of your destination country, um, because often there are scam sites out there that offer expedited visas for a fee. But you know they're likely they're wanting your personal information, your money, and you'll likely never receive that visa. Good to know. Any others that we haven't mentioned yet? Um, something that it's been kind of touched on a little bit, but, um, something that we see a whole lot in aviation in particular, um, is website, like third party travel agencies that aren't quite legitimate. Um, and so this is where really making sure you know exactly what website you're going. It is the website of your airline or your hotel or that specific legitimate third party booking agency like Expedia or booking or, or what have you um, is really, really important. Um, if you search Southwest cancellation or, or Southwest tickets or something like that, um, or insert airline here, or whatever, um, there's going to be a, a bunch of other sites that pop up, right? Um, so make sure before you call them that it is the right phone number, it is the right website, um, because you may end up with a ticket um, or a booking still, but you probably paid a whole lot more for it. Um, they may be also using your credit card for other things. 
Um, they may be trying to drain your loyalty points or your, your um, airline points. So really make sure that you are going to the website you think you're going to. A lot of these websites do look pretty close, um, but most of them, something is not quite right. Um, the iconography is not right. The branding is not right. Um, something just seems off and be extra careful when you're doing this on your cell phone um, because these things, th these um, companies very specifically choose to have their ads on mobile search engines. Um, so like it knows that you're coming, um, you're searching on a mobile version of Google, Chrome, um, Google search or whatever. Um, and they know it's harder to see the real, what you're looking for. Um, so make sure especially on your phone that you're going to and calling who you're intending to be calling. Um, and if something doesn't feel right, you can always hang up and try again. Um, and it's, it's never uh, always safe than sorry. Right. When, when dealing with those kinds of things, cause you can lose a lot of money that way. Yeah. Um, not Go necessarily. Um, Go ahead. Oh. Um, well, not necessarily a red flag, but just some themes to keep your eye out for. Um, threat actors have been known to use um, PSA PreCheck and global entry um, and emails uh, for a spear phishing um, lure, if you will. And then also COVID-19 entry testing requirements for uh, different countries, as well as COVID-19 vaccine availability links. Um, so pay really close attention to um, the emails that you are receiving for that, um, and like Liz had mentioned, like hovering over the link um, instead of the, just clicking on it um, and just pay close attention to some of those things. Lindsay, we have a question that's come in that I think is a good one for you. Um, somebody who I think is from a university who has professors traveling to foreign countries is asking about um, countries uh, where encrypted computer systems are illegal for travelers. Yes. Uh, Is that I, something I you can address? Uh, um, yes. So is the question what to do in those cases? Yeah, and or which countries those are. Um, so some of them are pretty clear. Um, if you go online, um, I believe, gosh, I'm trying to remember the website. But you'll be able to see if, if it's illegal in a specific country, they are very clear and upfront about it. Um, so, okay. you know, before going um, and there are all there are alternatives um, like VPNs um, in some places uh, are still available. And um, that's what I leverage typically. Um, and that's what I've told uh, some folks who go to some higher risk areas um, where encryption of your actual computer um, and a couple other things are um, a no-go. Um, there are alternatives. You just need to um, dig a little bit deeper to find them. Okay. Um, Nick, you mentioned earlier RFID scanners. Do you happen to know how close somebody has to be to you um, to be able to you know, pull data off a credit card or something? Do it successfully, they're gonna be almost right up on top of the device. So that's why any area okay. where you're clustered together with people typically in lines or, you know, um, those are gonna be where that typically happens. Okay. Um, somebody else has asked, am I safe by turning off Wi-Fi um, while I'm traveling and just using my cellular data? I would say that is a uh, excellent alternative, assuming you can get reception, right? So um, mobile networks are rather secure, as secure as it can be. Um, and, you know, it, it leaves out the piece of connecting to a network that you know you're unfamiliar with and will only be connected to for a short time. Mobile is um, always my preference. Okay. Somebody's asking about the FBI warning a couple of weeks, or maybe it was a couple of months ago now, about not using any free Wi-Fi networks while traveling or charging um, devices in airports and hotels. Uh, does somebody want to address that? What are your opinions on that? I know there was in the security community there was there were some people who felt like that was a very remote possibility, a remote threat because it's not scalable. 
um, for the bad guys are not as easily scalable, but what do you guys think? Do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, I like how we're all watching to see who's going <laughs> to go. Um, <laughs> just for the USB charging, um, I bring that up in every traveler brief. Um, I, I, I believe I briefed 300 people in three days last week. And in every single one of them, it was do not use USB chargers. I know it is so tempting and it is so convenient because it's right there. You don't need to carry a block. Um, however, those are not secure, unfortunately. Um, and it is an excellent way to compromise your device. Um, and I know it's inconvenient, but if you bring your actual charging block, um, that's phenomenal. And when I was uh, um, in a spicier country, I would actually charge off of my power bank and I would charge my power bank uh, with my cord. So there was never any connection to my mobile phone. Um, but if anybody wanted to answer the Wi-Fi question. You know, just to, I guess, kind of add to that as well, you can buy data blockers for USB. So essentially it, it maintains the two power pins on the thing and removes the data connection. So if if you must, uh, I looked today, there's six bucks on Amazon. So um, if you do need an alternative, you know, they're becoming a little bit more persistent with not um, allowing battery packs and things of that nature onto airplanes and in a cabin, et cetera. So, there are scenarios where you may need it. Um, a good cheap purchase uh, will protect you, so. Peg is asking, would you trust a free VPN? No. <laughs> I think, I think Peg got you are the product. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yeah. If there's not security concerns, it's probably privacy concerns, yeah. All right. Um, a few people have asked, Lindsay, if you can share a link to the advisory that you mentioned. If you can put that in the chat, everybody will be able to see that. That would be great. Definitely. Um, let's see. Um, Lindsay, does the Department of State coordinate with the FBI's IC3, the Internet Crime Complaint Center? Um, so we, before I joined the Department of State, I had no big, or no idea how big the Department of State truly is. Um, our coordination me measures are astounding. Um, if there's a group out there to coordinate with, we're coordinating with them somewhere, some way. Um, and communication lanes are always open. Um, so, yes, somebody is probably coordinating with them. Me specifically. Um, I coordinate with a couple different offices, um, similar, but not that specific one. Um, Liz, if you have resources that you wanna post as well in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, Cause I know you guys have a bunch of information available. Um, somebody's asking if I log into the Airbnb Wi-Fi to access my company's VPN, will I be working safe safely remotely yeah certainly best practice it will encrypt your traffic um between your device and your company so uh anybody who would be inspecting that traffic wouldn't be able to see what's in it unless they had the private key is it more or less secure to use your phone as a hotspot while traveling as we touched on earlier i think that would be that's certainly my preferred uh, method of connectivity if I need to connect on a computer or something. Um, Dan, this is for you in the background. We have a note that somebody says their chat is disabled. So if we can make sure that it looks like from where I sit, chat's enabled for everybody, but maybe- So now it's enabled so panelists can share their resources okay. and our panelists Great. can also send over any resources afterwards and we'll be sure to share them in a follow-up email to attendees. Great. Um, somebody asked, how do I keep myself from being hacked by family members that I'm sharing Wi-Fi with? I know in, in my household, we at least have a segmented network. We have family Wi-Fi, and then we have um, a guest network for people that aren't family that are in our homes. Um, any advice on people you're sharing the Wi-Fi with? 
Is VPN the answer here too? VPN would certainly be, I think, the best approach. But um, when you don't trust the people that you uh, share the network with, it's um, it's a precarious situation that you have yourself there. Yeah, you might not want to share the network. Yeah, certainly keep it updated. Your de any device, keep it updated. Make sure all your apps are are uh, mm -hmm. good to go, so they can't be exploited and uh, should be should be safe. So we have somebody asking about mobile devices and, and smartphones, keeping those secure. Um, are they more vulnerable to exploits in general? And aside from keeping our antivirus up to date and operating systems up to date, any other advice when traveling with a smartphone? Are they more or less secure than devices that aren't mobile? Um, so when I left, I got a completely different device. Um, so I had, uh, I think at one point I had three to three mobile devices. And um, there's a lot of best practices when dealing with mobile devices, don't jailbreak them. Um, I know that's really tempting, especially if you want more control over your phone, you wanna install uh, hacking tools, all of that, I get it, it's really fun. Um, but when you do that, you also strip away the security protection on it. Um, and then also a lot of people will go to an actual website to download an app instead of using the app store, um, don't do that. That's not great. Um, and then having a strong passcode, um, which I know maybe sounds a little bit redundant to what we've been talking about, um, but if they have physical control of your phone and you have one, two, three, four, zero, 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 one, 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 I mean, that's a pretty good guess, um, and then they're in. So um, mobile devices, it, keep them updated, applications, the iOS um, or, if you're not Apple, just keep the software itself, um, everything. A few people have asked about uh, what type of VPN we recommend, and um, we don't specifically endorse any, any products, but we refer people to um, articles on Consumer Reports and Tom's Guide and, and um, folks like that um, who do pretty thorough reviews of, uh, of that, those types of tools. Um, somebody's asking you to talk more about how consumers can set up a VPN. So I find them incredibly easy to use. Um, anybody wanna comment on setting up a VPN? I would say, oh, go ahead, Nick. Sorry, I talk so much, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. So, um, you know, there's varying degrees of, you know, complication when you can set these things up i think for a consumer base they've made it extremely simple you download the app you create an account again as we talked about earlier you definitely want to pay for that account um so then once you have that account the app's there i simply open the app click the button and i'm connected to a vpn uh, whichever one i've designated the app i use in particular as a list so i can route my traffic through various different end or um exit points from the uh, from that network. So if I need to go to another country for some reason um, and still want to access my stuff in the U.S., you know, hook up the VPN. There you go. Great. Um, kind of a complex question here. We have somebody asking, what are my um, what are my rights from either U.S. Border Patrol or or traveling in other countries as far as um, searches or questions at the border? Um, can I refuse to hand over my device? Can I refuse to unlock my device? Do you, Lindsay, does the State Department issue advice uh, for those situations abroad? Or do you uh, know how in the, in the U.S. if that's something that, that a U.S. citizen can be asked? Um, I think the tricky part here is, you know, when we do go to another country, it, we are guests. Um, they do have their own laws. Um, and we do need to respect that, um, we're not above them. So if they have something in place there that says you have to turn something over, um, if you don't do it, could be detained or they could throw it away, whatever they want, if that, whatever their law says. Um, but again, we are guests when we go to another country, um, but as far as specific guidance, direct policy from the department, um, I'm sure there's a, we have a 
a high threat travel to high risk areas um, webpage, and I'll, I can post it on here. Um, it has really great stuff for some of that type of uh, information. Great. Lindsay, you mentioned getting rid of your social media when traveling out of the country. Do you mean disabling it or deleting those apps from your phone or what, can you be more specific? Um, so I did actually, I probably should have completely deleted it, um, but I just deactivated a bunch of it um, because again, maybe uh, some places are more conservative and maybe some of my social media is, you know, is not in line with, um, the specific area or whatever it is. So, and it's just a it's just a good thing. And if your profile is not on uh, private, by the way, on anything, I very strongly recommend you turn it to private. Tell your mom, your grandma, uh, your brother, sisters, everybody, just put it on private because um, all that stuff uh, can be used against you. So. Nick, question for you. Should I lock my company PC in the hotel safe when I'm traveling or carry it with me everywhere? So um, from a physical security perspective, you can, I, th I think a safe is probably the best option. Um, and nobody wants to be carrying around a laptop the whole time. Uh, from the perspective of convenience, right? You know, typically, we, we do background checks on our housekeepers, right? Um, so we're making sure that at least from that perspective, the, the physical asset is, you know, more or less secure in your room. But I, I definitely suggest do not leave it logged into, do not leave it open, do not leave it powered on when you're out of the room. Yeah, I would also add they might want to check their company's policies. Um, we've, the places I've worked in the past have had policies that, that uh, go into a little more detail. Like if you're in the hotel, it has to be locked in the safe. If you're leaving it in your car, it has to be locked in the trunk. If you can't leave it, lock it out of sight, then you have to take it with you. So there might be nuances to your company policy if um, if you have, want to consult that. Somebody says, shouldn't I focus on using secure protocols versus worrying about network security and VPNs? Um, I'm not real clear on the question because uh, you know secure protocols, a VPN is essentially leveraging secure protocols to encrypt your data and pass it in a secure manner. So you're kind of achieving that end with a VPN. Um, so I guess if there's a, a clarifying point, um, I'd be happy to answer it again. How safe is cloud storage? Very broad question. I think it depends on whether or not it's legitimate cloud storage would be my first <laughs> would be my first question. Uh, they're asking uh, specifically about iCloud or, for example, iCloud. Anybody want to comment? I'll say that I use it for personal cloud storage. Yeah, um, I use again, it as well. I think here it's use it's read reviews and things like that. But go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I think the big companies, you know, your AWS, um, your iCloud, all the big ones have um, pretty good security in place. Now, that data is only secure as you keep your account, right? So kind of coming back to the password security, making sure your accounts are tied up um, and make sure your devices are configured appropriately. You know, if multi-factor, yep, that's a must. You know, if it's not enabled by default, which a lot of people are doing these days, um, you know, make sure you go and enable it if it is an offering. Um, and in addition to that, make sure your settings are appropriate, right? Um, you can remember some time back where there were a lot of iCloud um, accounts that were misconfigured to be publicly accessible, um, and the users didn't necessarily know that. Um, and then the other thing you want to think about is what is going up into that cloud. So a lot of people take all their pictures from their iPhone and they all get pushed up when some of them maybe you don't want them, maybe you want to have them on your phone. Um, and make sure they're deleted across the platforms too when you do decide that something isn't needed anymore. Um, Cause we have run into that as well where something was thought to have been uh, disposed of, um, ended up compromised and uh, you know, that data was out there and we didn't even know it existed still. So last comment, uh, kind of a devil's advocate comment here. Um, by using centralized services like a password manager or a dedicated VPN, 
aren't we just making the bad guys jobs easier now they just have to hack these services opinions well we can talk about um the password manager breach that happened not too long ago um you know there's levels and layers to that protection um you know just because the company gets compromised it doesn't necessarily mean that all your passwords are going to end up compromised there there is levels and i don't even think that um previous breach i haven't read any updates so pardon if i misinform anybody but i don't think they were able to actually access any customer passwords what they were able to retrieve so um yeah again so it's it comes down to what your appetite personally for um you know for kind of adding a little bit more to your daily routine in the uh for the sake of security so but it's certainly more secure than just writing them down i would say so yeah absolutely okay we're about out of time i want to thank everybody for all their questions and the amount of um uh, uh interaction that we had today everybody getting involved and and sending us your questions and I want to thank all of our panelists. Again, we are the National Cybersecurity Alliance. You can visit us at staysafeonline.org, and we invite you to follow us on social media, um, or you can go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. Thanks, everybody.